You should go back into your notes, and I want you to see what God has done for us. Number three, Christ restored your true sexual identity. Christ restored your true sexual identity. I said it at the beginning of the message. Let me reiterate. Paul uses very, very strong language. I mean, he comes out swinging, no holds barred. He starts off with the word, but among you there should not be. You know, when you first read this and you go, you know, Paul, why'd you do that? Why don't you just kind of soft sell like a dad? Why don't you come in and go, hey, kids, we just want to have a family conversation about something that's really important. But he doesn't. And he comes out of the gate, and bam, he just hits him. So why was he so insistent, so direct in his language? Well, I think it's for this reason. I think no doubt some of the believers who received his letter were struggling with their view of their sexuality and the habits and practices and customs of their society. They were living in the middle of reality. They were going to work and working with co-workers who when they tell a joke that has a line of humor in it are caught up in the laughing in the moment because it was kind of funny, but it was also degrading, dehumanizing, and it devalued someone. And they were caught in that tension of going, I don't want to pull away because then they're going to resist me or reject me. So I'll just kind of laugh with it, but I will never repeat it. See, friends, that's a reality for us, isn't it? Paul knew that. So he comes out strong and he goes, have nothing to do with this. But I think it's also very, very probable that there were some of them who were struggling with deeply entrenched existing habits that needed to change. Those of you that are caught up in ritualized temple prostitution, you've got to stop doing that. Those of you that have a mistress on the side, we don't do that anymore. Those of you that are coveting and having adulterous relationships with other people's husbands and wives, stop doing that. We don't do that anymore. This is who we are in Christ. Look in your notes, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8 and 9. Paul says this, you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of light consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth. So he gives us incredible insight. He goes, what you used to be, you no longer are. The way you used to live, you no longer have to live that way anymore. It's the power and freedom of choice, and you get to choose. This is so critical to capture I talked about this a couple, of, a couple of weeks ago. We talked about the before and the after picture, where Paul spells it so clearly for us. He goes, you were adopted, you are changed, you are restored, you are accepted, you are empowered, you are included. This is who you are. In fact, here's a word that I used. I said, how many of you know that you are saints? We're up to about 20%, folks. <laughs> you are in Christ. You are. Why don't we feel this way? This is why Paul's writing this letter. Here's what he knew. When you are trapped in the habits and customs and practices of, of society, you feel guilt, shame, and condemnation, and you don't feel like you're part of God's family. So you get trapped in by evil, but what he says is Christ has restored you. He has transformed you. He has made you new. And because of your new humanity, your new relationship with God, stop doing what you used to do. Start living the life that you have. Ephesians 1 verse 4, it's on the screen. It says, For God chose us in Him, in Christ, before the creation of the world to be what? What does it say? Speak it up. Holy and blameless. He chose us in Christ to be holy and blameless. I could never be holy or blameless in my own power. The Bible says my righteousness is what? It's like filthy rags. I can't do anything. I can't earn my righteousness. But God, through his son, Jesus Christ, paid the penalty, broke the power of sin, makes me holy and blameless in who? In Christ. So when he looks at me, he goes, you are a new creation, God. You are a brand new man, God. You have a brand new life, God. So stop living the way you used to live. Friends, I understand. Listen, I understand. There are habitual practices that require not only the power of God, but sometimes need a little bit of counseling and support to walk through. But you don't have to be entrapped by the lie of the enemy that says you can never break free and you'll never change. You can. Your new identity was provided for you in Christ Jesus. All things become new. The old is gone, and behold, all things become new. 
That means me completely. What a beautiful, beautiful picture. Write this down. God restored your true sexual identity. And write this down. And grace restored your sexual innocence. God restored your true sexual identity and grace restored your sexual innocence. You don't have to live under the condemnation of how you used to live. I don't care how wicked, how perverse, well, how much darkness your life used to be in. When you say yes to Jesus Christ, when you accept him as the son of God in your life, the forgiver of your sins, and you live according to his truth, your old ways are gone. And the enemy might tempt you with it. He might lie that you're still entrapped in that, but the reality of it is, is God has restored your true identity the way you've created to live, and grace has restored your sexual innocence. So start living it, and start enjoying it. And some of you need to hear that this morning, because the good news of the gospel is not just about saving us for eternity, it is about transforming us in the present. God rescued us from darkness, God redeemed us from our sinfulness, and God restored us from our brokenness. He makes us whole. Okay, I got two excited people in the room. That's awesome. And they're both over their 80s. What about everybody in their 30s? Isn't that great? Oh, that's so cool. I love you guys. Thanks, Kel and Mama, for cheering me on. All right, here's what we need to know. Don't trade your innocence for cheap substitutes. Don't trade it in. Honor God in every dimension of your life. Your sexuality is God's gift to you. Give it to God as an expression of praise and glory. Let your nurture, esteem, respect, honor, and purity lift the name up and glorify our Father who is in heaven. Ephesians 5, 10 to 14. On the screen, it's in your notes. Here's what it says. Paul said, find out what pleases the Lord. Figure it out. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but expose them. It is shameful to even mention what the disobedient do in secret. And then he goes on and he goes, but everything that is exposed by the light becomes light. Yeah. Listen, we have some decisions to make this morning. We have to decide that we are going to relentlessly guard our hearts. <coughs> relentlessly. That we are going to avoid activities and attitudes and expressions that will degrade, devalue, diminish, dehumanize, or objectify another human being. We're going to have to step out of conversations where people use language and illustrations and story or they celebrate that which is counter to the design of our sexuality that God has given to us. Or we choose not to participate in the repeating or the enjoyment of anything that would devalue another human being. We need to think differently. We need to choose differently. We need to talk differently. Friends, we need to live differently. And the sad reality is, we know the statistics, I've shared them here before. The sad reality is that it's hard to distinguish the percentage, the percentile differences within the church and outside of the church when it comes to the area of divorce, sexual promiscuity, pornography, we are no different than the world. The numbers are marginally different. I mean, it's not even enough to measure. And yet Paul writes to this emerging group of followers, and he goes, do you understand? You're a new humanity. You're, you're a brand new community. And you're going, you don't get it. You don't get it. This is too hard. It's too hard to live in a culture that just not only promotes, but it's saturated in us. No, friends, it's hard, but it's possible. We talked about this. The church in first century Roman Empire was so in love with God and so committed to living out what Paul would write to them under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that all of a sudden these little bursts of light begin to transform darkness in their communities. And it just would ripple. And it would go further and further. And it began to illuminate so much so that communities and then cities and eventually the entire empire would formalize their allegiance to Jesus Christ as the true living God. 
history has changed a few things. But history will never change the power of God when people choose to live in righteousness. Because when people choose to live in righteousness, they can transform their world. When I was about four years old, I remember going to church with my parents. And when they went off to their service, they dropped me off for the kids program. In fact, there was, at that point, there was four kids living in the house, but I remember going off to our kids program. And I've never forgotten this. We were in a small country church, southern Alberta, down in the prairies. Great attendance of about 65 on a Sunday morning if it really hit the top. And the teachers that were leading Sunday school, the little kids program that day, those of you that bring your kids in, you'll understand, were at the front of the room. And they taught us a course. And I've never forgotten. Simple, simple course. Oh, be careful little eyes what you see. Oh, be careful little eyes what you see. For there's a father up above who's looking down in love. Oh, be careful little eyes what you see. Oh, be careful little ears what you hear. Be careful little ears what you hear. For there's a father up above who's looking down in love. Be careful little ears what you hear. And then it went on to do the hands, the feet, and finally it said the mouth. Be careful little mouth what you say. Maybe, just maybe, Jesus knew what he was talking about when he said, Unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Because the innocence of children will protect the innocence of their sexuality. And just maybe, we have some decisions to make today. And some of you are in the room. And the moment I started to talk about sexuality, there was a knot in the pit of your stomach because there has been guilt, and fear, and condemnation that has gripped you. There's a tension that pulls. I just want you to know something. You don't have to live that way. When you give your life to Jesus Christ, it doesn't mean it's going to be easy, but it means it's going to be transformed. And your life will be different. You'll go from darkness into light. When we say yes to Jesus, they're not just words we live. It is a declaration where we say to the enemy who has distorted our innocence, we go, I choose to believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that he shed his blood for my sin, and through his death on the cross and his resurrection from the grave, that power defeated sin. It broke the power of sin, it paid the penalty of sin, and I'm free, and I'm free. And that's what we do when we say yes to Jesus. And today, some of you, the enemy is still lying to you, and he's telling you, you don't have to give it up. You don't have to change your ways. You don't have to change your habits. You can, and you can be free. And all you have to do is say, Jesus, I'm in. I say yes to you. There are others of us in the room this morning. We need to change. We need to change. And nobody can pick up a stone. And nobody can cast the first stone. But we are all guilty of our own level of sin and indifference. We have all failed God on our own fronts, but we need to change. And some of you, you're going to need to change the habits and practices that you're embedded in. Some of you, you're going to have to get right with your families. Others of you, you're going to have to fix those marriage relationships, renew those commitments to each other. Some of you that aren't married yet, you're going to have to quit sleeping around. Some of you that are living together, you need to get married. That's what God invites us to. He doesn't say bring the world in and let's see if we can work this out. He said, how about we kick the world out and I'll show you how to live and live the way I want you to live. And it's a great life. So as we pray together, whatever your decision is, let's take a moment and listen for the Holy Spirit because he'll tell us. Holy Spirit, we stepped so lately into this moment. For truth is revealed when you speak. And in this room this morning, we all need you to speak to our hearts. It's not one of us that couldn't look back on our life or even look at our life today and go, wow, it could have been so different, and it still can be. So I pray as we listen to your words, we listen to your voice, 
Some are just saying yes to Jesus Christ for the very first time. And they're making Jesus Lord of their life. And they don't even know what's in front of them. Here's what they do know, though, that they're going to walk in the light of his truth. And it's going to be such a great life filled with joy, assurance, power, strength. Others are in the room, men and women, young adults that are just making decisions today. I'm going to break that habit. I'm going to change my lifestyle. I'm going to stop doing what I shouldn't do. And I'm going to start living the life that Christ has called me to. And while we can't be responsible for everybody else, Father, here's what we know. We need to take responsibility for our lives. And so by the power of your spirit and the expression of our prayer, we give you our lives back. We give them away so you can use us and you can be glorified through us. I pray that in Jesus' name. Would you stand with me this morning?